It's a well-known fact that everything was better in the good old days. Summers were hotter, neighbours were friendlier, and policemen would give you a cheery wave as they clipped a small boy round the ear. But what about politicians? Was there a golden age when our MPs were upstanding men and women of integrity, who had the respect and love of the people? Or were they held up to as much ridicule and contempt then as they seem to be today? Here's David with a blast from the past. Your first sight of the government front bench on the far side, you will have seen Mr Wilson, Mr Healy, Mr Hogg, Mr Bottomless, Keith Joseph, Roy Jenkins. The state opening of Parliament, 1966 style. Some of the names may be familiar, the decor much the same, but the politicians from a very different age. This place may not have changed very much over the past 50 years, but what about the people who make it tick, our MPs? Are they much the same as they were when everything was black and white? And do we still treat them with the respect they think they deserve? David Winnick first came into the Commons as part of the class of 66. It's fair to say, a very different time. I suppose um, you weren't expected to do all that amount of work. Um, that doesn't mean MPs were uh, uh, lazy or the rest of it, but it was a different type of job if you spoke two or three times a year. That wouldn't be considered inappropriate. If you visited your constituency infrequently, uh, that might be the subject of a bit of criticism. It's totally uh, changed. But are our present-day MPs reaping the rewards for all their hard work? What do you think? If you go back to 1966, 97% of people thought their own MP was doing a good or a fair job. Jump to 2005, it's not quite the same question, but I think it shows the trend that actually only 46% of people thought their MP tried hard for their constituency. So, yes, I think there has been a decline in satisfaction with MPs. And they wouldn't get away with making the odd cameo appearance in their patch. There has been a shift towards wanting MPs to do much more constituency work and to prioritising constituency work over, the, over national politics. But we still want our MPs to push forward policies on the national stage. And I also think there's a trend at the personal level to reject the kind of professionalisation of politics and to want MPs to look a bit more like ordinary people. But still, compared to this cynical, less deferential age, where the media almost seems to go out of its way to make them figures of fun, MPs did get a lot more respect from the public in the olden days, didn't they? I'm afraid not. Um, it, uh, Dickens's uh, parliamentary sketches didn't show all that amount of respect for MPs. If you read much of the literature of the uh, 19th century relating to parliamentarians, they were often the butt, like now, ridicule and criticism and the rest. And I'm sure that was so before. It doesn't seem to be a golden age at any time. And politicians should accept, you know, that uh, it is perhaps part of the British tradition to have a go at us, uh, and why not? The cars may have been cooler, health and safety less of a big deal, but were the MPs better in the good old days? Well, maybe not. Well, to talk about the changing nature of the job of being an MP, we're joined now by Charlotte Leslie. She's a Conservative who entered Parliament in 2010. And our guest of the day, Chris Mullin, who was elected in 1987 and stood down in 2010. Just briefly before I come to you, Charlotte Leslie, Chris Mullin, are you envious of Charlotte's position today? It seems that with things like the right reforms and the Backbench Business Committee, she's in far better position than you ever were. Uh -huh. Well, actually, I think the rise of the select committees uh, uh, over a much longer period, the last 30 years, has increased the influence of backbench members of parliament, which was pretty low in the 1950s and 60s in this alleged golden uh, age. That's made a huge difference. And yes, there have been some, you now elect, it, it previously, uh, up to the time I retired, actually, the, uh, um, uh, the government really had, the whips had rather large influence. Well, and the you were whipped within an inch of your lives, weren't you? In, the... in my case, not so. I know. <laughs> uh, 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 but, uh, they tried, the, though. The, the, not for want of trying, yes. Um, do you think you're in a better position now? It does seem that individual MPs, if they want to take up an issue, do have avenues that they can do so. It's obviously very difficult for me to compare because I, I wasn't around then. Um, I think Parliament get, takes a little time to get used to as a new backbench mm. MP. Um, I think you have to make a decision whether you really want to get promoted very quickly, in which case, of course, there are avenues, but it may not be wise to choose them, or whether you're going to pursue things that really matter to you. But I think there are enormous opportunities, and I suspect through the reinvigoration of the select committees, which can be very powerful, um, you do feel that you can make a substantial difference. And even if you do it with respect and correctly, I think there's every avenue to disagree with your, your own government. Yes, and how's that gone if you do disagree with uh, your own government and your own party? I mean, not, not you necessarily, but for 
for instance, one of the most notable things that came through the backbench debate calling for a referendum on the UK's membership of the EU, which obviously wasn't necessarily what the Prime Minister wanted, but that is an example of how MPs managed to get what they wanted through to talk about. Absolutely, and I, I was one of the MPs who voted against the reform of the House of Lords, which has, has changed an awful lot, whatever you might think of that decision. Um, I think if you want to get on the front bench very quickly, it's probably not the wisest option. But I'd also like to think that if you do it correctly and in a reasoned way, um, we want MPs on our front bench who do have principles. And I'd like to think, and I think this government is very much like that, that people respect differing points of view. Do you think the Speaker John Burko has helped that? Has he not put Parliament at the forefront here to challenge the executive much more effectively? I know many Conservatives aren't very keen on him, but is that because he actually challenges the government? I think, again, it's difficult for me to comment not having been an MP under any other speaker. But I think there's certainly, and John Burko is part of this, a freshness. Um, I think often familiarity breeds contempt. We can get into our politicians' lives much more than we ever have done before through Twitter, social media. And that demands a freshness and humanity, I think, from the establishment itself in order to keep connected with the public. I think John Burko has been an excellent speaker, incidentally, and, <laughs> and, and done a great deal to, uh, uh, to raise the standing of Parliament from it has to be said, a pretty low base. But, I mean, under Labour, for example, it didn't really... MPs didn't feel they had the room, did they, to manoeuvre to actually... I don't think it was a question of whether it was Labour or Conservative. Well, they were there, I, though, for 13 years, weren't they, at a time when it was felt there was such control. Well, Labour had enormous majorities for the first 10 yes. years, and that, that was certainly a factor, though. There were pretty large uprisings, 139 Labour MPs... Uh, but nothing, uh, like, as rebellious, the, nothing like as rebellious as the well, MPs under the government. coalition. We've got a coalition government now. That changes the mathematics. I mean, actually, I think the thing that has changed, and it probably will stretch the elastic about as far as it will go, is because MPs have got allowances that enable them to open offices in their constituencies uh, and, and do a lot of things they couldn't previously do. They didn't even get postage in the 1960s, I think. Uh, certainly not telephone calls outside London at one <laughs> time. Uh, um, they, uh, a lot of them have, in, instead of focusing on holding the executive to account in Parliament have spent a lot of time, especially those in more marginal seats, acting as fairy godmothers to their constituents in the hope that they'll be re-elected next time. Uh, and I think that's that's gone a bit too far. I personally. might disagree with that. I think there's a false dichotomy between constituency work and what you then do on a national stage. In Parliament, you're stuck in a bubble. Your only source of information inside that bubble is the House of Commons library. The constituency is your reality library. It's where you go to talk to people who are not a journalist, not a researcher, not a, another politician. And I get the most valuable input from my constituency. And yet, places like pubs, where it's always a chore to go. Of course. Um, but Top things like that, it's very valuable. All right, Charlotte Leslie, thank you. Now, there's just time before we go to find out the answer to our quiz. Chris Money, if you